Welcome to our seventh session of the Wonders of God. Uh, today, we're not going to be using our Bibles, but please have your manual uh, at the ready. We'll be following through. We're going to be taking a look at Law and Gospel, Chapter 13. It's on page 51. We're going to be talking about justification, and then we're going to be talking about the Spirit's means. And then in the latter half of our 45 minutes together, we're going to start with baptism, and that is on page 71, but I'll let you know when we get there. All right. Um, thank you so much once again for, for being with us. Uh, if you understand chapter 13, you will understand the Evangelical Lutheran Church because everything we see God saying to us in the Bible is either law or gospel. I mean, every denomination has their characteristics. I mean, you, you can't go to a Catholic church without seeing the Mass being celebrated. Um, an Assembly of God church, you kind of expect somebody to get up and speak in tongues, or an old-time Baptist church, somebody to walk down the aisle to get saved. These are the focus points of their, the focal points of their services. But for us as Lutherans, the high point of the service, and this probably explains a lot, is the proclamation of God's Word, the proclamation of law and gospel. We see everything God's saying to us in terms of law and gospel. And this isn't just our quirk. We see this in the Bible. For example, Bible passage 1. The law was given through Moses. Grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. Well, the law of the Ten Commandments, okay? What God tells us, this is what I expect of you, and if you don't do it, there is trouble. And then grace and truth through Jesus Christ, that's the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but have eternal life. God's promise to freely forgive sins, grant life and every blessing through faith in Jesus Christ. Now, let's take a look at what the law says, because if I only could proclaim the law, I would not be a Lutheran pastor. Uh, to be quite honest, I would not uh, be a Christian because the law is simply telling us God is ticked at you because you haven't followed what he told you to do and he's going to get you. Bible passage 2. Through the law, we become conscious of sin. The law acts kind of like a mirror. Um, unless we are the most conceited teenager in the world. You and I, we all use a mirror for the very same reason. Uh, we look into it to see how we look. Do I, get, do I get smutched on my face? Is my tie right? And and so we can get ourselves fixed up before we go out in uh, decent society. Well, the law shows us what we look like to God morally. And when we look at that law, those Ten Commandments, we realize we have not kept them. We are not perfect as God wants us to be perfect. We do not display the holiness He expects us to display in our lives. And um, <clears throat> the law comes with baggage. Okay, and here's some of that baggage. Bible passage 3. Cursed is everyone who does not continue to do everything written in the book of the law. Now, the law doesn't say, <clears throat> I have to be better than my neighbor. No, that's not what it asks. It says we have to continue to do everything written in the book of the law. From our earliest days, all of our life, 100%. And we've got to keep 100% of those commandments. And in a way, this shouldn't be such a revelation because, hey, if I get picked up for speeding, I can hardly say to the police officer, but officer, I've always paid my taxes. That doesn't matter. I've broken the law in speeding. And, and when you think about it, it's like, well, then nobody's perfect. That's right. That's exactly what the law is trying to tell us, that not a one of us can get to heaven by our own goodness. Okay? It's like the law is a stop sign. 
Stop trying to be your own savior. Stop trying to think that, that you're good enough for God. Stop trying to think that you can earn your way to heaven. And we might be thinking, well, if I can't get to heaven, there's going to be nobody there. God can't send everybody to hell. Well, look at Bible passage uh, 4. No one will be declared righteous in his sight by observing the law. That's exactly what the law says. Nobody is going to get to heaven by being good enough. Well, if I can't be good enough to get to heaven, I, I, I kind of want to get to heaven, though. Isn't there another way? Now the law has done its job. It's gotten us to stop thinking that we can fool God or pull one over on him so we can weasel our way into heaven by our own good works, okay? Or by knowing so and so. Um, and it makes us look for a different way to heaven. And now we're ready to hear the gospel. And the gospel is a totally different message. Bible passage 6. Christ redeemed us from the curse of the law by becoming a curse for us. <coughs> we were under that curse of, of the law, but Jesus took that curse upon himself when he died on the cross. He took all of the punishment that we deserved. In Bible passage uh, 7, just think of the Christmas story. <coughs> Excuse me. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news. Barbie, you have to cut it off. Okay. Stop it. I need some water. Just think of the Christmas message. Bible passage 7. Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. The gospel message is that we do have a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus Christ. He is the one who's going to get us to heaven. He is the one who has kept the law perfectly for us. He is the one who laid down his life on the cross to take that curse of sin off of us. Jesus himself put the gospel this way. Bible passage 8. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned. Now, if you're following along with this, um, you will agree with me with that, that old saying, uh, nobody's perfect. Nobody is perfect. We all have our failings. And if we simply apply that to our relationship to God, I don't have to go any farther. Uh, the Bible says, Bible passage 9, If you, O Lord, kept a record of sins, O Lord, who could stand? But with you there is forgiveness. We need this forgiveness because nobody's perfect and Jesus has come to be the Savior for everyone. This brings us to justification. Now, justification is, as used in the Bible, it's, it's a legal term. Okay, uh, you go into court, uh, it's a criminal case, and they decide whether you are guilty or not guilty. And at the end of the trial, the verdict is rendered guilty or not guilty. If you're declared not guilty, you're justified. You are just in the sight of that court. Well, the Bible says, Bible passage 12, using that same legal framework, Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they are red as crimson, they shall be like wool. I mean, if sin was red paint, we would all look like a fire hydrant. Uh, we are as, as guilty as sin. But for the sake of Jesus Christ, God simply declares us not guilty of sin. And if God makes that declaration, then we are. Bible passage 13, 
God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. I mean, it, it's like the God's better than Santa Claus. Santa Claus keeps track of stuff. He's making a list, checking it twice, going to find out who's naughty or nice. And if you've been naughty, man, you are going to get a lump of coal in your sock. But God doesn't keep track of sin anymore. Um, you think with the uh, problems we've been going through, you think Bill Gates has been going to the, the magazines to clip coupons so he doesn't run out of money at the grocery store? I doubt it. That guy has more money than he could burn through wildly in a hundred lifetimes. Well, that's like God. God is not sitting there biting his fingernails in heaven wondering, oh, is the human race going to out -sin what Jesus has paid for on the cross? No. Jesus' suffering and death on the cross had infinite value. So God can simply write off sin. He no longer counts sin against us. We have been justified through Jesus Christ. Now, <clears throat> Who is this justification for? And, and here is where uh, we are greatly different from a lot of the Protestant churches, okay? Because people, they, they divide the Christian dem into like, oh, you're Catholic or you're Protestant. Lutherans are kind of in the middle there. And, and here's one of the reasons why. Um, a lot of Protestant churches teach, uh, well, they don't, they don't want to make God look like uh, um, inefficient like a klutz. It would be terrible if the suffering and death of Jesus on the cross was wasted. And so they'll say things and, and teach things like, Jesus only died for the believers. Jesus paid for the believers' sins when he hung on the cross. And certainly it makes God look 100% efficient. So not a single drop of Jesus' blood was wasted. Um, but the problem is then it puts the monkey on our back. Am I a believer? And I tell you, my faith sometimes is like a shy little mouse. I, I look for it and it disappears. There's times I don't, I don't think like I'm a believer. I don't feel like I'm a believer. Uh, does that mean I'm not a believer, that Jesus didn't die for me? Um, it, would, it would be kind of ridiculous to even share our faith with people who weren't believers. What could we say? Oh, Jesus died for my sins, but ooh, since you don't believe, I'm sorry. He didn't, he didn't uh, die for yours? No, that's, that's not what the Bible says. That, that Jesus died for all people. Okay, L look at Bible passage 17. And I'm sorry, I'm going to have to act like your seventh grade English teacher. Remember those bad old days, uh, diagramming sentences, underlining the subject, double underlying the verb or circling the verb? Okay, let's do that with this Bible passage 17. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Okay, that first phrase, all have sinned. All right, all is the subject, so there's one line. And have sinned, that's the verb, so we circle the verb. Pretty cool, pretty easy. And now to the next one, and fall short. Well, that's a clause by itself. The verb is fall. Circle that. Who's the subject? It's the same all. In English, if the subject is the same for one verb as the next, we don't repeat the subject. So in seventh grade, I had to draw an arrow from all over to fall, okay? So all have sinned, all fall short, and boy, we understand that because nobody's perfect, and are justified freely by His grace. There's the next clause. What's the verb? Are justified. There we go with the circle. Once again, where's the subject? There is no, oh, there is a subject, it's just not expressed, because it's the same all. All have sinned, all fall short, and all are justified by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. Jesus died for the sins of every single person, and because of that, Every single person is justified before God. So just stop and think about it. <clears throat> Even when we 
do things that we like, oh, no Christian would ever do that. Boy, God can't forgive me for this. I am so, I, oh. No, we are justified. We are forgiven. Jesus paid for those sins. That's what keeps drawing us back to God. The message that God gives us is not, yeah, come and take your beating like a man. Uh, no, it's there's forgiveness, there's love, there's acceptance with the Lord. And that's why that's the message that dominates in our dealing with the children. Uh, the love, the acceptance, the forgiveness, it is theirs. Because Jesus died for their sins on the cross too. Uh, Bible passage 18 brings it out even more. Just as the result of one trespass was condemnation for all men, and we think of Adam in the Garden of Eden, so also the result of one act of righteousness was justification that brings life for all men. Adam sinned in the Garden of Eden and everybody was condemned. Jesus dies on the cross on Good Friday and everybody is justified. Can one person have that much of an impact on so many? For just as through the disobedience of the one man, the many were made sinners, so also through the obedience of the one man, the many will be made righteous. Yes, one person can have that much of an impact on everybody. And then let's, let's look back at Bible passage 19 again. God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. Now here's another rule of English. If there is no adjective in front of that noun, God was reconciling the world. I cannot add an adjective that changes the sense. I cannot say God was reconciling the male world. God was reconciling the female world. God was reconciling the, the new world, the old world, the first world, the third world. The only adjective I can put in there which doesn't change the sense of the sentence is all or whole. God was reconciling the whole world to himself in Christ, or God was reconciling all the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. There was a great exchange that took place. God takes Jesus' righteousness, his holiness, his perfect life, and credits it to our account. Remember Abraham? Abraham believed the Lord and he credited it to him as righteousness. So when God looks at us, he doesn't see a mixed bag. Oh, they're not perfect. Oh, they're trying, but they're not perfect. No, he sees people who are holy, sinless, because we're forgiven by Jesus. We are wearing Jesus' righteousness. And then the, the muck, the sin that we had, that was put upon Jesus' shoulders when he died on the cross. Uh, so this justification is for all. Now you stop and think about that. Well, how can this be? Because if everybody's justified, everybody's forgiven, everybody should be in heaven. But I know that's, that's not how it's going to work. The believers are going to be in heaven. The unbelievers are going to end up in hell. How does that work when everybody is justified? Well, that's where justification through faith comes in. Let's say it's uh, the second week at weekend in February, and I am so glad that the NFL has not expanded its season to the end into February, because I tell you, if Super Bowl Sunday was the weekend of Valentine's Day, there would be so many divorces already. The cruise ships are getting in on it, so like halfway through the playoff season. Did you notice this past year, Princess Cruz was saying, you know, you've, you've neglected her for 18 weeks, make it up to her with a cruise. Well, let's say um, you two are down at the mall, and uh, uh, shopping, and uh, oh, but you made a tragic mistake. You still remember when that mall on Maryland Parkway was the place to go with Dillard's and May Company and all these stores, 
And uh, so you go down there, and it's like all of a sudden, oh my gosh, it has changed. There are, uh, th there's people that have piercings on things you didn't even know you could be pierced. And you're kind of walking down the promenade thinking there's got to be a department store that I remember still open. And there's this guy who is just kind of <clears throat> weaving as he's walking towards you. And, and he's bumping into people. You can see him bumping into people. And, and they all go like this or that. And you know why they do it? Because he bumps into you, those stinker. I mean, literally, it's, it smells like he hasn't taken a bath since uh, George Bush was president. And he stuck a piece of paper in, in your hand and in your spouse's hand. And, and your spouse doesn't even want to think where that has come from, so she just immediately drops it and just starts rubbing her hand like everybody else. Whereas you, you wait until a wastebasket comes in, boom, two, okay? Well, behind you, by about yeah, maybe 30 feet, <clears throat> two seventh grade boys. They got a little time to kill because their mothers dropped them off at the mall on Martin Luther King Day, and they said, we'll pick you up on St. Patrick's Day. And this guy sticks two pieces of paper in their hands too, and the one kid says to his buddy, hey, come on, let's go. Where are we going? We're well, going to the bank. Right over across the street. Going to the bank, why? We got this check. Come on, oh, let's book. No, come on, let's go. We got time to kill. Let's go. And so they trudge over there to to um, the bank, and and the, the kid puts it up to the teller, and she says, "I'm sorry, sir, we can't handle this transaction." And his buddy says, "See, I told you it was bogus." And she goes on to say, <clears throat> "We're not allowed to give out that much money in one transaction." Because the check, the, the check wasn't some, from some homeless person. The check was from some eccentric gajillionaire. It was payable to the bearer, $100,000. And you had a, one of those checks, but, but you threw it away immediately. Your, your spouse had one of those checks. $200,000, boy, you could really knock down the old mortgage with that money. Um, and you threw it away. But these kids, they cashed the checks and they got the money that was there for everybody. Every time we come into the world, every person that comes into the world, it's like God sticks a little spiritual check in their hands. Payable to the bearer, full and free forgiveness of sins. Signed, God. And some people look at it and they're like, there is no God, and they throw it away. Uh, some people look at it and they say, um, I don't need this, I can do it myself. The, the pride, you know, work righteousness, I can earn my way to heaven, I don't need God's charity. There's others who say, well, you know, there, there's gotta be some strings attached. I know in the good old days, I mean, I got, I got, I got unsolicited checks in the mail for $3,000 all the time. All I had to do was take that $3,000 check down to the dealership and I would get $3,000 off my next car. I don't know how they did it. Maybe that's why so many of them are out of business now. But you know how they did it. Either the value of my trade-in would be $3,000 lower or they jacked the price up $3,000. Eh. But those who believe, who cash the check, get what God is offering. By faith, they make it their own. It was good and valid for everybody. It is justification for all, but it's justification that is received through faith. Look what the Bible says. Bible passage 21. The righteous will live by faith. And Bible passage 22, believe in the Lord Jesus and you will be saved. And let's go back to John 3, 16 again. Justification for all is joined with justification through faith. For God so loved the world, there's that all, that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him, justification by faith, shall not perish but have eternal life.
For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever does not believe is condemned already, because he has not believed in the name of God's one and only Son. They've got that forgiveness, but they don't believe in it. They throw it away. Um, <clears throat> now, this faith, is this faith perhaps such a good work that that earns heaven? Is that the one thing we can do? Yeah, the Bible says even that faith is a gift from God. It all is God's loving gift to us. Bible passage 24. A man is justified by faith apart from observing the law, and apart without any kind of human endeavor. Um, it is Bible passage 25. It is by grace that you have been saved through faith, and this not from yourselves. Even that faith we have, that's not something is of our own doing. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So, here we have the foundation of our Lutheran teaching of law and gospel, that there is a Savior for all. All are freely justified by Jesus Christ's suffering and death. Believe it. Now, what, how does God get that message of forgiveness to us? What does the Holy Spirit use? Bible passage 27 on page 53. Faith comes from hearing the message. Oh, but remember, there's two messages in the Bible, law and gospel. Which one brings us this message of forgiveness? And the message is heard through the word of Christ, the gospel. That's why the gospel is going to predominate in everything we do. Every one of the chapels we have with the kids, I want them just hopping and skipping out of chapel thinking, what a wonderful friend I have in Jesus. What a wonderful God I have. How happy I am to be a child of God. And, and I kind of want everybody going out of church on Sunday morning with that same feeling because through the gospel, people come to faith. Remember Evangelical, Green Valley Gospel Church? That's what we're talking about. And uh, the message that God has given, it, it's been given to us to spread. Bible passage 29, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Whoever believes and is baptized will be saved, but whoever does not believe will be condemned. It's a message for all. And God tells us to go out and tell it to all. Um, we have been entrusted with the gospel. Bible passage 30. For ourselves, grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. I mean, if we only went through first grade and then stopped all our education, where would we be now? Not where we are. Or, or if we were satisfied with a high school diploma. Or, or we were in a job where we needed some continuing education. My wife is a pharmacist. She needs that continuing education. But if they never got that continuing education, oh, I've never even heard about these new drugs. You couldn't get a job. You need to grow in your knowledge. And in the same way, we need to grow in our knowledge of God's Word so our faith can grow. Life is not going to get easier. And God wants our faith to get tougher, to be able to handle those challenges. Um, Bible passage 31. Let the Word of Christ dwell in you richly, as you teach and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs with gratitude in your hearts to God. Kind of sounds like a church service, almost. And I, I think we should think of church as a, a training, a training, um, uh, what a, a class, okay? Spin class. Uh, can I get in shape on my own? Probably not. <clears throat> but if I pay money to be with a group that encourages me and some class leader who's going to chew me out, I probably will get rid of this fab of flat. Um, Bible passage 32, but it's for every family to pass their values on to the next generations. Fathers, do not exasperate your children. Instead, bring them up in the training and instruction of the Lord. 
um, it's a wonderful thing in a Christian family because really the rules of the house are just applications of God's Ten Commandments. And your son, your daughter, they're not a rebel without a cause. They're, by, as believers, they've got the Holy Spirit inside them that wants to do what is pleasing for you. And you got to admit, we can joke about <clears throat> having to practically use tasers on our kids, but admit it, about 95% of the time, they are so happy to make you proud of them. They are so happy to show their love for you and their thanks for you by what they do. That's because the Word of God is dwelling in all of our lives richly and fully. And Bible passage 33, go into all the world and preach the good news to all creation. Christianity is not just a message for us. It's a message for all people and we find ways to share it. And then Bible passage 34, I guess I'm at the stage of life where you're like, yeah, did it really matter that I was even here? Will people even notice? Well, if I'm measuring by terms of how much money I piled up, no or uh, what the community at large thinks of me, probably not because I'm not going to be able to donate about $60 million to UNLV and have my name over some lecture hall or something. Uh, but for each one of us, through faith, God promises our life will have eternal significance. Bible passage 34, I am the vine, you are the branches. If a man remains in me and I in him, he will bear much fruit. And you just, as exhibit one, you just look at your children. You see what the love you've poured into them, the faith that you've shared with them, the values that you're trying to impart in them. That's going to last long, long after you to your grandchildren and great-grandchildren. And they'll be heaven, people in heaven, who come up to you and say thank you for sharing this story with your son because that's the story that saved me. This is the last section of today's lesson, and we're on page 71. We're going to be talking about baptism. Now, um, I make a big thing about baptism. It comes up in at least two places uh, in our chapel talks, one where Jesus himself is baptized, and we've talked about that previously. Um, and then also, before Jesus ascends into heaven, he gives that, that great command to his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them. Uh, how do I know I'm a child of God? If I've been baptized, I've got objective proof that I'm a child of God. But let's, let's carry this out in the lesson. Okay, on uh, Bible page 71, Bible passage 1, Jesus' command, Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Jesus gives his Christians this command to go and make disciples by baptizing them. Now, <clears throat> that word baptize simply means to, to apply water in some way to cleanse. Uh, so whether you dunk somebody or you pour water over their head or sprinkle water over them, um, how you apply the water doesn't matter, but that you do apply water with that Word of God. And let's take a look at that Word of God. Um, <clears throat> we're baptized in the name of the triune God, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Bible passage 2, you are all sons of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who are baptized into Christ have been clothed with Christ. How do I know I belong to God? How do I know I'm in God's family? If I've been baptized, that's when God made me part of his family. And I'm clothed with Christ. That explains why maybe our grandmas call baptism, oh, you're getting Sammy christened. Christened? Yeah, Jesus Christ is put upon you. His righteousness, His holiness is now counted as ours through that baptismal faith. And that explains why some families got the tradition of even the boys. They, they dress them in these white flowing baptismal gowns. The kid might have a load of diapers underneath, but in God's sight, He's perfect, 
uh, holy, sinless, without wrinkle, blemish, or spot. Um, now, uh, sometimes people say, well, you know, I was baptized <clears throat> in the Catholic Church. So if I want to become a Lutheran, I, I suppose I should get baptized in the Lutheran Church. And I say, no, don't. It's dangerous. And they kind of look at me like, uh, we always thought Peeper was a, a little too high strung and maybe he's going to pop his lid now. But no, it is. And, and I can give you, uh, let me give you an illustration. Um, in my house, <clears throat> my boys have oh, gone through every tool I had. That's why I used to go down to the mall on Maryland Parkway and uh, Desert Inn uh, to go to the Sears store because I could go in the back way, just go right to the hardware section and buy those craftsman tools. I lost every, my boys lost every craftsman tool I had. I probably had the most iron rich yard in the world. But let's say um, I, uh, my glasses were messed up and, and uh, um, Karen always had those little tiny gla uh, screwdrivers um, and so there, there's one of those out in the little red wagon. There's also a, a two foot long construction screwdriver out there. God only knows how that got into my garage. But there is an electrical outlet in my daughter's bedroom that has never worked. And finally one day I decide I'm going to fix it. My son Andy happens to be home. He's on the couch watching TV and I say, Andy, I'm going to fix that electrical socket up there in Elisa's bedroom. And so I want you to go outside and pull the fuse box. The fuse box, yeah, it's, it's the thing outside the garage. You open the panel up. Well, where's It's by that glass bowl that looks like it has an aluminum frisbee rotating around it. You open up that, that panel, and there's two, two circuits in this house, A and B. B is for upstairs, so pull B. Like, remember, better pull B or I'll beat your butt. Got it? Got it. Well, he watches TV for just a little bit longer, then he decides to go out, and sure enough, he's forgotten which one, and he pulls A. And so here I got this little eyeglass screwdriver and this big two-foot-long construction screwdriver. Let's call the little screwdriver an Episcopalian screwdriver. Let's call the big construction screwdriver a Southern Baptist screwdriver. It doesn't matter what screwdriver I'm going to use, I'm going to get electrocuted because the power is still going through that circuit. I don't care what kind of baptism you call your baptism, Roman Catholic, but you were not baptized Roman. You were not baptized in the name of the Pope. You were baptized in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. I was baptized Lutheran. No, you weren't. You weren't baptized in the name of Luther. You were baptized in the name of the uh, Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, the triune God. <clears throat> in all of these Christian denominations, Baptism is valid and effective because they're using water with Christ's commands, using God's very words in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And if you think you've got to get rebaptized, you're falling for the biggest lie there ever was spoken in the religious world. And that lie is, your faith is only as good as the church you belong to. And that's not true. Your faith is only as good as the God you believe in. Because when we believe in the triune God, the power is flowing for eternal life and salvation. God makes a promise to us in baptism. Bible passage 3. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills be removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord who has compassion on you. And yes, the mountains will be removed, the seas will be shaken on the last day. But even then, God's promise, I will always be your God. I have forgiven all of your sins will be valid and sure. Who is baptism for? Baptism is for all nations. And, and here all, I don't know, kind of old-fashioned here, I think all means all. Um, and so if it says all, everybody, young, old, there's no age limit. 
Um, so in the Lutheran Church, we baptize little children. Certainly, there is a need for that baptism. Um, Bible passage 5, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the Spirit. And the Savior's attitude towards little children is very clear, even though he's not talking about baptism here. Bible passage 6, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them, for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Um, baptism is one way. We bring our little ones to Jesus. Uh, according to his command for all nations using water with that word of God and uh, who can baptize uh, Christians normally it's going to be the clergyman okay the the priest the deacon the pastor the the minister um, Jesus said Bible passage 11 go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them and surely I'm with you always to the very end of the age it wasn't just a command for the first century Christians it's for the entire duration of this world um, so that's what we teach about bap the institution of baptism next lesson uh, we'll be talking about the blessings of baptism and go into the Lord's Supper thanks for watching and be sure to fill out that quick quiz so you get credit for watching this. Thanks.